All right. Um, yeah. Thank you for coming and listening. Um, my talk is titled Dirty NoSQL, How Simple Is Your Database? Um, it's basically about writing your own database in Node.js and why it's maybe a really stupid idea, but maybe some parts of it are not. And um, yeah, first a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a Node.js contributor. I picked it up right when the mailing list was still pretty small, 30 people. Um, I have a startup. With, I'm a co-founder at it, Transloaded. We do uh, video uploading and encoding as a service. Um, one of my bigger open source projects with Node is a uh, driver for MySQL. Uh, which is pretty crazy, talking to the binary protocol. Um, and other people are um, binding the native C driver for Node, but this one is completely built in Node. So everything is non-blocking. It's not using any C code. You don't have to compile it. And I hope I can get the performance pretty close to whatever C can deliver. Um, and I'm also a source of one of the libraries uh, that you can use in Node to uh, talk to CouchDB. And, uh, so I have a little bit of experience with working with databases as a user, as an author of client libraries, but I'm not necessarily an expert writing databases. So if at any point you think something is completely crazy and stupid, please let me know so we can filter out the good stuff from the bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. As Jan said, I'm really happy to be here. Um, the volcanoes this time got defeated by this channel, uh, channel man here, and uh, I hope it's not showing up again. Um, first of all, I'd be interested in what everybody's using these days. I mean, we hear a lot about people using NoSQL, but what about this room? Who's using um, a NoSQL database in general? That's about half of the people. Um, what NoSQL database? Uh, CouchDB? That's a bunch of people. Uh, Redis? A bunch of people as well. Mongo? Anybody crazier? Ryke or other stuff I haven't mentioned? Ryke? OK. Anything else totally out of the ordinary? OK. So Cassandra apparently is not represented. Um, who's using um, a SQL-based database? That'd still be most of the people. <laughs> um, is it MySQL or P MySQL? That's a bunch. Uh, Postgre? It's the same people also, I think. Some people <laughs> raised their hand twice. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, but good to know, uh, but I think there's still a lot of people using SQL and a lot of people using uh, NoSQL. My general opinion about it is just because NoSQL is all the cool hype and stuff today, I think most of the applications people build uh, these days, until they get hit so hard that it becomes a scaling problem, what database technology you choose, you should really look at your data. Is it relational or not? And if it's relational, I mean, Facebook scales MySQL. It's possible. So, um, But nevertheless, I like to play with the cool stuff as well. And uh, here comes the presentation on Dirty. Basically, uh, the idea behind Dirty is that I really liked CouchDB when I first played with it. I really liked uh, writing my query code in JavaScript, having JavaScript views. I thought it was really neat and a uh, more interesting way to get at your data and queries. And at the same time, I haven't really used it much, but I, I looked a lot at it and uh, learned a lot from it. It's Redis, um, which is also a very interesting key value store, trying to solve a different class of problems, but it's basically one of the fastest ones out there. It's uh, basically, you can imagine it as memcached, um, but with a disk backend, so when you restart your cache server, it's not going to be all gone. But I think people are also starting to use it as a full blown database. Um, so let's talk a about a little bit of the design choices in this library that I'm working on. The biggest one, of course, is that it's built on Node.js. Having the non-plucking I.O. is a wicked fast V8 JavaScript engine are big wins for anybody trying to write a simple database. Um, how big of a win you can see here. It's 150 lines of code compared to CouchDB or Redis, which each weigh in at about 16,000, 15,000 lines of code. Um, MySQL, by comparison, has a code base of 1 million lines of code, but it's really hard to tell from their repo <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to tell from their repository how much of it is a bunch of crap that's not even executed when you run a database and how much is actually used. So I, I'm not going to put that up. But yeah, basically 150 lines of code for me is a design choice because I'm going to talk about it further. But this library is meant to only solve a very specific class of problems and then show solutions to other classes of problems by um, yeah tricks and stuff that I learned writing it. But it is minimal on purpose. But I think it's useful even with the minimal way it's structured. Um, <coughs> so another design choice is a really simple file format. Um, so file format is actually new line appended JSON. So whenever there's a record written to disk, uh, it stores one JSON entry. Uh, it has two keys. 
the first one is named key and holds the value of the key, and the second one is val, which holds the value. So the value can be anything, can be a string, an object, anything that's JSON serializable, and uh, same goes actually for the key. Um, so what's good, what's bad about this? Bad is, you can already guess, it's not going to scale forever. That's gonna, you're going to hit the point where loading your database is going to take forever, uh, because, and you cannot really seek to a specific point. So that already limits the scope of this project drastically. But at the same time, it, uh, if you're starting out using a technology like this, can you imagine a sweeter database format for eventually migrating to something else? I think it's really easy. You could probably do it in a bash script. So that's, that's a design choice, and I'm pretty happy with it because I think it works well for what I'm trying to do with it, and it also works well for bigger systems with uh, bigger goals like Redis. They're doing the same thing. They have a more optimized data format, but it's also an append-only lock with no indexing whatsoever, as far as, as, far as I know. Um, and this is probably the most interesting choice. There's no networking. So this is an embedded database, which has downsides, but it also has a lot of upsides. As you can see, it's really easy to get started. You basically install the code. Uh, you get this little module called dirty, which you can require, and it returns a function, which actually basically is a function that runs the constructor of it. And so the first parameter passed into it uh, is the name of the database file that you want to access. And there you go. You have the database object. You can start setting keys on it, getting keys on it. And there's a lot of beauty with it. First of all, you don't need to write a client library. Every new database that comes out basically requires people to go out and write new client libraries for it. Be it Redis, CouchDB, which is smart, they're using HTTP, or uh, Mongo, they all need native clients. That's a lot of code that needs to be written on the server side to uh, support the clients asking questions and del delivering the results, but it's also a lot of work on the client side. And every other language that you want to use it in, it's not going to work. So that's a benefit. There's no delay. Uh, on uh, setting and getting keys, and uh, there's also no issues with networking in general, no connection issues. Uh, you don't need to authenticate because your file system is your permission system. You build on top of that. Um, yeah, here's another example that shows how easy it is to use. You basically uh, set a key, give it a value, and then uh, once you have a bunch of keys in your database, you can use DB for each to iterate over them, and that's basically how you query it. There's no filter function per se, but you could uh, create an array above uh, so for each line, which basically captures all the data that you iterate over. And uh, that makes it really minimal. You've already seen most of the API on this project, because I can type them in and change them however I want them. Uh, and a lot of people doing benchmarks do that. But what's actually even worse is they try to publish benchmarks of benchmarking against other databases. And it is really difficult to get this right. I think Jan, uh, who's not here, has a really nice article on it. Most of these benchmarks that you see will compare apples to oranges. One database might does a whole lot more on insert and has, has a whole lot more guarantees on what's happening than another. So benchmarks are really tricky, and unless you want to spend as much time as writing your project takes and doing the benchmarks properly and also getting to know all your competing uh, databases, you shouldn't do the comparisons and draw conclusions from it. You should, if anything, look at the underlying algorithms and see if they're suitable for your problem. But anyway. Um, Standalone, uh, it has a pretty good performance. If you call the get operation, you get uh, 50 megahertz, which is 50 million uh, get operations per second out of it. Um, I don't know why you would need that, but what is interesting is that the V8 primitives, the underlying uh, object types in the V8 engine, are fast enough to pull that kind of stuff off. I mean, I have the V8 number. At the bottom, it's like 160 to 170 megahertz uh, to get keys from an object. And I think that makes it a really fast engine and maybe fast enough to write bigger systems than this one is. Um, because once you start doing more algorithms and more iterating over data uh, in a more complex database, that's going to be a bottleneck if you're really crazy enough to write a database in JavaScript. Um, if you write in C, then, well, you're almost writing native processor uh, comments. So there's not a whole lot you need to optimize anymore. But here you need to be careful that your bottleneck is not the language. And it may very well might be. Um, then the set operation is also very fast, not quite as fast, but it can run at uh, 5 megahertz. Um, the V8 uh, does 12 megahertz. The so performance is pretty much lost because I need to do two operations. Uh, when set is called, I need to set the object key of the key value pairs that I'm writing on the object. And then I also have an array, which is basically a queue of all the keys that still need to be written to disk. So I push into that array, and I set on this object. So these two operations is what cuts the performance in half. 
But then again, find me a disk that can do 5 million inserts a second. I, uh, it looks pretty hopeful that the language primitive here is not the bottleneck uh, for pulling this off. Um, uh, now, maybe more realistic or interesting way to look at it, when you're actually flushing to disk, because obviously the numbers before were not flushing to disk. It was basically putting stuff in as fast as possible, and then, well, the queue uh, for the disk write would flush eventually. But these are actually numbers for uh, flushing items to disk. And if you're using pure numbers as a key and value pairs, uh, you can do about 200,000 uh, of these JSON records a second. Uh, I think in my um, setup, I benchmarked on this machine, so your numbers may vary uh, a few times, but probably not an order of magnitude. Um, the main bottleneck is serializing to JSON, and well, on the other way, also deserializing from it. Um, another number next to it is if instead of writing just a number as a key value pair, but you use a 256 byte string, uh, you get around 70,000 uh, records per second. So, what I really like about these numbers is that it really looks comparable to what other systems uh, p that are performing similar operations can do. Uh, like Redis, basically, when you go through the network, they have benchmarks of being able to set and get around 100,000 keys a second. And so you can tell that memory access is so, so much faster. Network is actually slowing Redis down. While Redis is setting and getting keys, it's basically idle processor time. It cannot, uh, the network is not fast enough to fill out your CPU speed, which I guess you should know, but that's a really interesting thing to know about databases. Like some of the stuff is just uh, loss of physics. I mean, your light is only gonna go so, f so far or so fast on your electricity, and there's nothing else you can do beyond that. So actually, the design choice of embedding a database into your process where you can share memory, no inter-process communication, no networking, might be an interesting one for certain stuff. Um, oh, I had one number I forgot. Basically, uh, when I run the same uh, operations without JSON serialization, uh, the numbers change from the left to 2,500, uh, hertz and to 400 her, uh, kilohertz, sorry, not hertz, kilohertz on the other side. So it's the chasing serializing is holding it up uh, quite a bit, like 10 times. Um, and that's a for each loop. So this basically is used to uh, iterate over the, all the keys and all the values in the database. Um, that's probably the biggest bottleneck right now. It could be much faster. Um, basically what it does, it's it doing a four bar in and then calling a function on every object that it meets. And that is suboptimal because, first of all, it's blocking. So while you're for-eaching over your data set, you're not doing anything else. And second of all, you can't stop in between. For war in is basically everything or nothing. So one of the things I'm probably still gonna do is whenever a key is being set, uh, I'm gonna maintain an additional array which lists all the keys. And then I can iterate over all the keys uh, much faster and I can also choose to only partially iterate over the keys that I have. That will make the set performance a little bit uh, slower, probably uh, cut it in half again, but at the same time, for each can become non-plocking and can become much faster. But I didn't have the time to do it yet. It makes implementation a little bit more difficult. Oh, and yeah, as you can already see, this implementation hits the wall at some point. My design goal with this database is to make a wonderful database for less than a million records. So basically, if you're new to Node, I mean, how many people have played with Node yet? in this room. All right, not, not everybody yet. So if you're new to Node and you just want to get started as quick as possible and get like a little toy project going, I want this to be the database of choice. That is easy, uh, throw it in there, it will work, and you can even, if your little project takes off, it can even scale for a little while. I mean, a lot of applications out there, I would say, I don't know, more than half of the applications that run on the web right now will never need more than one million records. It's only the really successful ones, and we are lucky when we get to see scaling problems, but I think this database is really easy to migrate from because it doesn't do anything special that other databases can't do, but it does it really fast for the less than mil one million record mark. But yeah, basically uh, after that, you're hitting the wall. I mean, your for each loop is blocking, I might fix that, but your queries are gonna take a very long time iterating through all of that. You're gonna have to start in doing indexes yourself, optimizations yourself, which might be fun. You, you might be able to push this much further, but at the same time, not everybody wants to write his own database code. But I think, and that's the next part, 
uh, I think maybe Node.js has the possibility of writing something like CouchDB in it. It has a non-plucking I.O., it has excellent networking, and it has a lot of other really good parts in the stack and very fast interpreter. So what's the rest of my talk is about looking uh, into the possibilities of actually taking Node and building a more advanced system out of it than Dirty. Dirty is just my interest in building such systems, but I wouldn't have the time to build something compatible to, or compatible, comparable to CouchDB or Redis. That's, that's going to be a big effort, but what I'm exploring is, is it's possible. Does the V8 engine allow you to do it? Does Node allow you to do it? Um, let's have a look against the, at the problem we're up against. That's the internet traffic growth over time. Uh, I started from 2000. Uh, and as you can see, we're going to need to think of solutions for the data problem very quickly because the data is growing exponentially. Um, the number you just saw is there's 22 exabyte per month, every month going through the internet right now. It's 22 billion gigabytes. Um, I had no idea what that actually means, but one exabyte is about 50,000 years of DVD quality video. I had no idea so much porn exists, but apparently it does. <laughs> <laughs> apparently it does. And yeah, 90% of the internet traffic in 2013 is projected to be video, so not all of it's going to be data, uh, data in terms of what we store in a database, but it's still going to be a lot. So what is one of the things that I really like about my little key value store that might uh, make an impact on solving this kind of data problems? I think one of the things is flexible guarantees. With most databases, you make one big trade-off most of the time. Either you are guaranteed that when the database says the record is written, it's really on disk and it will stay there, or it says, well, I have it on my list of things to do and I'll eventually get to it, but if my power is being cut off, that record is lost forever. And that's a big problem because I think a lot of applications actually have mixed needs. They have data that needs to be really transactional. You say it's stored, it needs to be stored, and a lot of other stuff, you don't care if you lose a record here or there. And uh, what you can do with Node, thanks to non-plucking I.O., is uh, you can set your key value pair, and uh, as soon as you set it, it's written to the object, you can access it again. That's a console log record written to memory down there. And uh, then you get a callback when it's actually flushed to disk. So you can get both events. You can get, OK, it's ready to be worked with part of a query, and it's ready to disk, so if you reboot me, it will still be there. Um, I think that's a really interesting concept that is, would be really difficult to pull off with any other embedded te database technology. Um, oh, by the way, what I also wanted to talk about how this actually works internally. Um, the write mechanism of Dirty works that whenever a record is written, it starts flushing it to disk right away. And then if there's more records written uh, with the set function, and the disk is still busy flushing the first record, it queues them all up. So basically, the, when the first uh, record is written to disk, it looks at the backlog log of maybe 1,000 items and says, OK, now I'm taking all of these, chunking them together into a long JSON string, and writes that. So all your writes are pretty much instantly which uh, with Redis, I think the append-only log, they, I don't know, I think they have two mechanisms now, but I think one of them was to basically do it every one second or three seconds or something, which y you don't really have to. You can use a queue when the disk is busy or write to disk when it's doing nothing. I think they have, they have a change? Yeah, they yeah, okay, so that, that got it better. Um, all right, memory and disk hybrids. I think one thing I could really imagine this kind of databases to do is to um, be a mixture of a database and your application. So you might have some basic libraries to do data, solve data kind of general data kind of problems for you, but then you can also build memcached basically into it. You don't have to query your database and query another memcached instance just to keep something very fresh and hot. You can actually have your database do the caching itself. And you can't really do that with other databases that easily because other databases, they don't know about your data. But if you're using out your specific knowledge about your data. Um, replication. I think you could build a really nicely replicating database with uh, Node.js just because it's perfect for streaming. I mean, streaming is one of the main points of why Node exists. Every other web technology kind of was fast before and was kind of usable. Uh, but none of them made it really easy to stream and still do something else at the same time. Request responses were looked at at a singular event. You get a request, you process it, you send a response, but there's nothing in between. With Node, streaming is really easy. Um, 
Also, another thing that's really easy with, uh, in regards to that is Node could hold an incoming connection if a, a replicated key, or if a not yet replicated key is being requested. What that means is some of your clients writes to one of your uh, database servers in the cluster, and then another client goes and asks another instance of the same database cluster for that key. But the key has not replicated yet. Well, Node could actually say, uh, if I get a request in for a key that does not exist, I wait for three seconds. If it still comes in, I uh, answer the request as soon as I can. Meanwhile, I let the connection hang. I think that's something where you could build really small systems that don't have to take the eventual consistency trade-off that a lot of other systems take, just by saying, yeah, we'll do eventual consistency, but we can also hold a, uh, a query for three seconds if we have a hope that it's still being successfully um, executed in three seconds later. Um, web services. You could also use Node.js to act as a proxy for different database backends. Because I, I don't believe one database is ever going to solve all your problems and fix everything, especially when you go to a certain scale. But it would be really nice to have a unified interface for all your business questions that your, your clients are asking and your cloud is going to answer. And I think Node.js could make a really nice clue in between maybe some own Node database or maybe not. Talking to a CouchDB, talking to a Redis backend, and just shifting this data together, but also knowing about your business problems, combining the data properly, doing good caching. That kind of makes it act as a layer in between. And you could even like query third-party services. If you're building something really big that depends on a bunch of other business processes somewhere else, your database could directly take that in, into account as well. Um, yeah. So that's the basic thing, and I think there will be uh, a lot of questions about this kind of crazy experiment. I hope there were a few good ideas in, but I'm also open to hear any of the really bad ones. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, you just put an if statement in there if I understood the question properly. If the problem is if it's concurrent, so you have to do it. So, like, the hit Basically, says when you get and set, there's no I/O happening. Yeah, exactly. With with dirty, it's purely in memory, and the only I/O that happens is actually uh, fl flushing the record to disk eventually. Yeah. The same used in both cases. Well, there's no network interface. You have no other way of getting at the database from the outside. Unless you would right. So basically. No, uh, I think I had, I didn't have 50 million records in the database because there's a um, problem with V8 right now. V8 caps you at one gigabyte of heap usage. Right. One gigabyte is plenty to store one million records. Uh, memory usage on this is one million keys have an overhead of at, uh, around 27 megabytes. That's if you just store numbers as key value pairs. And so the rest is going to be filled up by your data, whatever length your uh, keys are going to have in your uh, data. But that get benchmark was also just 1 million, maybe 1 or 10 million records, uh, and the keys and the values were numbers. Okay. So that was the only thing going on. I, I can actually show the code for the benchmark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, That's yeah. fine. Like, another one thing to just to really big to get Yeah. But <laughs> the, the main... Um, point of the benchmark was to see, okay, you can get a key which is cutting performance in half at this speed is still pretty accessible, acceptable for having so many function calls. I mean, the 10 million function calls. So that's pretty good. And one lesson maybe to be learned from that is if you're writing node code with a ton of callbacks and you're like, aren't all those functions are going to slow my code down? No. You'll need a lot of functions to do that. And a lot of function calls. Yeah. What function? Yeah? No, for each, uh, it's not the native JavaScript for each. It's. Yeah, I think that was 1 million records, and it's basically using for var in, which I'm going to replace with an array uh, list of keys, I think. 
Christian. Oh, yeah, you shouldn't, use, you shouldn't try to evaluate this against Redis unless you're yeah. planning to have a very small project. Okay. Yeah, but no, it's not, there's no query abstractions because all of that stuff, I think, is the main thing that databases out there get wrong. That's yeah. because it's the hardest part and everybody likes it their own way. Right. All right, um, if you want to download it, uh, if you're already using Node, you probably have NPM as a package manager, so it's NPM install dirty. Uh, dirty, by the way, the name comes from the fact that this database violates a lot of good practices that you would think of when writing a database, like a chase and a pen only thing is kind of crazy, but it works well for one million records, so it's a dirty hex that gets the job done for really small stuff. Um, I also mentioned the startup I'm working on, Transloaded. We do video uploading and encoding. Uh, it's all Node.js based. If you're interested in that, uh, chat me up about it. And yeah, last thing, be careful and don't hit the wall. <laughs> right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>